everyone. Welcome to the Ottawa Children's Storytelling Festival. <laughs> I would like to start off by doing a land acknowledgement. We are on Algonquin unceded territory. <laughs> What? I know this. You know this? <laughs> I'm blanking, guys. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that we are the Ottawa Children's Storytelling Festival is run by the Ottawa Storytellers in partnership with Odawa Native Friendship Center. And sorry guys, this is my first time hosting. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Children's Storytelling Festival. This is, and we are at the O'Dowd Native Friendship Center location in the earlier center. <laughs> I, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We are in a Algonquin unceded territory. So the Ottawa Story nah. <laughs> the Ottawa Children's Storytelling Festival is in partnership with the O'Dowd Native Friendship Center and a whole and a whole bunch of others. <laughs> Hi, Crystal. How are you doing? I am doing well. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Brad with the Ottawa Children's Storytelling Festival, and I'd like to offer you this sage for your story tonight and the spirit knowledge that you will share with us. Thank you. So uh, tonight we have four, four different storytellers will be coming in to tell their story. First up, we have Louise Prophet LeBlanc. <laughs> the next storyteller will be Kathy Compass. And the next one will be Kathy Jessup. <laughs> and our last story will be Crystal. Crystal Snowboy. Crystal Snowboy. <laughs> um, I, Kathy Jessup, would you like to give a little bio of yourself, where you came from? when you do your story. So when everybody comes up, they're gonna tell you a little bit about where they, where, where they come from and why they're here. And just to share another story. We're so happy to welcome you into our community of storytellers. So our first storyteller tonight, and I'll pass you off to her, is... Louise. Louise Prophet Leblanc. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. 
I'm sure that all the children here, you know what a smudge is, right? And I think it's really important that we recognize that stories bring all of our ancestors here to this circle. So I'm just going to light a little smudge for us. Do you like stories? Yeah. I do. I do too. And especially I like stories about my grandma who's been gone now for, wow, I can't believe it. My grandmom has been gone for over 60 years. But when I tell the stories about my grandma, my kukum, it's like she's here. And so she'll have a visit with you as well. So I really want to thank all of you who have come tonight and thank all the children who are going to be hearing what my grandma has to say and some of the things that occurred when I was a little girl, like you, small. Do you know what's coming up pretty soon? Yeah. What? Christmas. Hey, I never believed in this big fat guy coming down the chimney. 
because we had a wood stove. And I thought to myself, yikes, he's going to get burned. It would probably be better for him to just walk in the front door, knock before he comes in, be courteous, be respectful. Yeah, Christmas is coming. So I'm going to tell you a story. And actually, the story came to me after my brother passed away. His name was Lawrence, and we called him Lawrencey. And Lawrencey had the biggest heart ever when he was an older man. And when he passed, all the little kids came to me and they said, Auntie, who's going to come and get us now in his truck and take care of us when our parents can't take care of us? I said, don't worry, i got two other brothers here. <laughs> So I put them to work. So I actually wrote this story. It's from my imagination, but it really ventures into a place where children might like to go, and especially with their loving parents. So Lawrence was really excited. His father had been sharpening all of his knives, getting things ready, oiling his guns, getting all his traps prepared. They were getting ready to go out for a whole month in the bush because his father was a trapper. Do you know what a trapper does? I'll tell you what a trapper does. In the old days, people like fur coats. And the indigenous people love fur coats too, and they like to use the fur around their mucklucks. They like to use the fur around their parka hoods, and they like to use the fur for mittens. So there's a lot of use for fur, but you can't get a fur, a piece of fur, without trapping the animal. And I'm sorry to say, I love animals too, but people who are meat eaters, something has to die. And this is what a trapper does. But a trapper does it when he puts his trap down to trap an animal, maybe a lynx, maybe a fox, maybe a wolf, maybe a wolverine. He lays him down, he lays tobacco down. And he asks the creator to bring him this animal. So it's done in a very respectful, honorable way. So Lawrence's father, Lawrencey, his dad was a trapper. And Lawrencey was getting excited because every year they would go out. In fact, Lawrencey went out before he was even born. When his, when his mother was pregnant with him, she went out to the trap line with her husband. And they stayed out there and they got enough fur to last to be able to buy food, to be able to take care of his family for the rest of the winter. Now, the sound of a skidoo, do you know what a skidoo is? Some people don't know what a skidoo is, but it makes a lot of noise. And so Lawrence's father was out there, you know, taking care of the spark plugs, making sure that this skidoo is going to be operable because you do not want your skidoo to break down on the middle of a lake with your children. So this year that they were going out, Lawrence's little sister was going with them. He has a little sister now. She's just a little tiny baby. She's still being breastfed on her mother's breast. And Lawrence was fascinated to watch her because she'd be sleeping and she'd still be going as if she was still taking milk into her mouth. And he liked that about Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. So they learns his father got everything ready, put everything on the back of the sled that they would be needing. What do you think they needed on the back of the sled? Well, they might need bedding, a good warm sleeping bag, right? They would need fuel, they would need food, they'd have to put all of their trapping gear. Everything had to be nicely stacked.
established on the sled because mom, mommy, and two kids had to also get on that sled. But these sleds were pretty big and they were able to get all of that on there. Off they went to the trap line. Now, Lawrence's five years old. And his dad is starting to call him a little man. Okay, little man. Oh, that makes him feel so good. <laughs> little man, you bring in some kindling. I'm gonna cut a little, the little kindling for starting the fire. And little man, you're gonna bring it in. Because you have work to do here too. And Lawrence, he felt so good that he could do this job for his mom and his dad. As soon as they got to the cabin, his daddy unlocked the door and mommy went inside. And her job, of course, is to get the fire going. Well, daddy unloaded all of the gear and got everything, brought everything into the house. Now, what kind of food do you think they would bring into the house? What do you think they would need? Do you know? Chicken wings. Well, it would be kind of hard to get chicken wings, but you know what they eventually got? Ptarmigan wings. That's the birds that grow out there. Chickens don't grow too well in the snow. But they had flour. They had salt. Hey, you don't go out in a bush without having tea. And sugar. And what else do you think? What do you think they'd make bannock with? Grease. <laughs> you need some lard. Okay, so those are just the things that they might be bringing out there. Of course, they brought canned goods, they brought rice, they brought onions, things like that. Macaroni, even. So, while well, mom was getting the fire going, Lawrence, he still had his parka on and he was helping dad. At least he thought he was helping his dad bring the stuff into the house. That night, he felt really good because they lived in the city. And going out there in the bush, everything was really quiet. And he looked through his window, which was frosting up, and he could see up into the sky. Through the frosted window, he could see billions of stars which he never saw in the city. They are probably there, but they weren't so visible. And he really gave thanks. And before they went to sleep that night, they gave thanks for everything they had. And they gave thanks for having a safe trip. Now, Lawrence, he was at that camp for maybe, I don't know, maybe three weeks or so, when his mommy said, Dad's going to be going into town tomorrow. He might be getting some things for Christmas. And Lawrence thought to himself, Oh, that means... Where are they? Yeah. That means that... Dad's gonna get some oranges. These little tiny oranges that when, when he was a little guy, he was with Grandma. And usually Grandma would peel the big, big oranges for him. And then at Christmas time, she'd bring oranges. And she said, here, have an orange. And he said, Grandma, can you, can you peel the orange for me? She said, no, those are kids' oranges. And kids can peel them themselves. And he was so surprised. She said, just put your fingernail in there and it'll come off. And sure enough, the baggy skin just came off the orange and it was so good. So he was thinking about what would dad bring back? And he hoped that he would bring oranges. But you know the other thing he was thinking in his little heart? I hope he brings the person who usually gives us the oranges. I hope he brings grandma back that would be really nice to have Grandma here because she usually did come out with them, but that year in the, when they decided to go in November, she wasn't feeling good. 
So the next day, Dad had everything already loaded on the toboggan. Skidoo is all ready to go. You know, the dogs in the skidoo are barking. <laughs> And Dad says to him once again, okay, now you're the man of the house. You help your mom, you help her take care of your little sister, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Oh, of course, Lawrence's little chest is sticking out. Yes, Daddy, yes, you know, and he watches as the skidoo, the lights went in to the woods, heading towards town. That night, he was thinking, again, it would be such a good Christmas if Grandma was here. But he just let that thought go. The next morning, and he had seen her do this a few times when Dad went out to check the traps, he saw his mom sewing. And when she would hear the skidoo coming, she would cash, cash her things away. And he said, what are you sewing, Mommy? He said, now I've got real three days, I've got to, I'm making your dad some mitts. These are special mitts. These are skidoo mitts. You see how they put fur on the outside of mitts? And you put nice beadwork? But what does a skidoo mitt need? It needs fur on the inside, right? Fur on the inside of both mitts. Because you know when you have a mitt, these, these fingers keep each other warm. But the lonely little thumb on both hands, you know, for breaking this canoe, for putting the gas, you know, the thumb is freezing by itself. So the ingenuity, indigeneity, they put fur on the inside of the mitt to keep the mitten warm. These are very special mittens. And they're probably up to here. Why are they up to here? So they can come over the parka so that snow couldn't get in there. And the most ingenious thing that they have for mittens, maybe you have some too, they have a braided string around like this. And you twist it in the back like that. My grandma used to call it idiot string. It was very handy because you wouldn't lose your mittens. And you can also just uh, tangle it in the back like that so you can work on your, your traps, you can work on your skidoo, and you have both mitts handy to put back on and get your hands warm. So, Lawrence took care of everything he could. He went down to the lake took the tarp off the lake there where his dad, he's got a little small bucket like that. He said, you know, I can go down and get one bucket, but you could go down and get four and fill up your mom's water container. And he did that. He brought in wood. He dragged some over on the toboggan. He was a pretty ambitious little boy. And he was feeling good about himself. Now the second, third night, he's just about ready to go to sleep. And he hears something familiar. What is it? <laughs> what is that? Skidoo is coming up. And it sounds like it's really working hard. <laughs> you can hear it's working hard. Oh, daddy must have a big load. Sure enough, comes into the yard. <laughs> comes up into the yard right in front of the door. And he's, by then, he heard the skidoo coming quite a ways away, got dressed, put his moccasins on, put his parka on and his mitts and his hat, and he's ready to help his dad. And he goes out there, and he sees the skidoo drive up on the back of the sleigh, a big sled, is a big tarp over all his stuff. He's like, oh, daddy must've got a lot of stuff from the store. He's looking out there, runs up, his dad gives him a big hug, and as he's giving him a big hug, he looks over like that, and the tarp comes off. Who's there? His grandma, his Coco. And what does she have in her hands? She has a little box of oranges. And 
that's the story about Lawrence's Christmas. Thank you. They can. <laughs> that was Louise. <laughs> what did I want to say? <laughs> Thank you, Louise, for your wonderful story. It took me back. <laughs> now our next storyteller is Kathy Compass. <laughs> About 40 years ago, I started going into school as a helper and reading stories in my children's class. But always someone was saying, Miss, Miss, I can't see the pictures. So I started telling stories and that really solved the problem and it's a lot more fun. Wonder if you could try this. You're going to need one of your arms to be a tree, maybe the arm that's holding the orange. Hold it up and let, let your other hand be a pussycat. The kitty went up the tree. The kitty went up the tree. Her nose went up, her toes went up. The kitty went up the tree. And what did the kitty see at the tip of the top of the tree? She saw the tip of the top of the tree. So the kitty came down the tree. The kitty came down the tree. Her nose came down, her toes came down. The kitty came down the tree. Very nice, I like watching all those cats go up and down. Aaron was playing in the back yard, catching butterflies in a butterfly net. And Mama came out on the porch. Erin, I've got to go to work. It's time for you to go to the babysitter. And Erin said, I don't want to. But Mama had to go to work, so Erin went to the babysitter. When Erin got to the babysitters, the babysitter took one look at that. And the babysitter said, Erin, you need to cheer up. Let's make a gingerbread kid. So they took a bowl. If you do that, you'll have a big bowl. And then they took a spoon. And they stirred in flour and Crisco, an egg, gingerbread, and other good things. And then they rolled out the cookie dough. Do that? That's beautiful. And then Aaron cut out a gingerbread kid cookie. A head, two arms, and two legs. And then Aaron gave the gingerbread kid eyes with raisins, a nose with a walnut, a cinnamon red heart smile, and three, show me three, chocolate chips for buttons and the babysitter put the gingerbread kid in the oven and then the babysitter said don't open the oven until the bell rings i need to make sure you're listening what did the babysitter say don't open the oven until the bell rings. And then the babysitter went out to weed the garden and Aaron sat down on a stool in front of the oven and looked through the little window and Aaron saw that gingerbread kid get brown and crispy and puffy and then Aaron heard that gingerbread kid shout, help, help, it's hot in here. 
I'm burning up. Now, Aaron remembered what the babysitter said. Don't open the oven until the bell rings. But Aaron didn't want the gingerbread kid to burn. So they opened the oven just a tiny little bit the size of your baby finger. But it was too much. The gingerbread kid jumped out of the oven and ran twice around the kitchen table, shouting, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread kid. And the gingerbread kid ran out the back door. And Aaron came right behind with oven mitts on their hands. The gingerbread kid ran right past the babysitter. And the babysitter said, stop, stop, little gingerbread kid. You look good enough to eat. And the gingerbread kid laughed and shouted, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me on the gingerbread kid. And down the street went the gingerbread kid. And the babysitter, with a handful of weeds, came right after. And right behind that was Aaron with oven mitts on. The gingerbread kid ran and ran to the corner of the street, where the crossing guard held up his hand and said, Stop! Stop! Little gingerbread kid, you look good enough to eat. The gingerbread kid laughed and shouted, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me on the gingerbread kid. And the gingerbread kid started running up the hill and right behind came the crossing guard with the stop sign, the babysitter with a bunch of flowers and Aaron with the oven mitts. That gingerbread kid ran to the top of the hill and ran right past the fire station where the fire chief was <laughs> polishing the fire truck. The fire chief shouted out, stop, stop, little gingerbread kid. You look good enough to eat. Gingerbread kid laughed and shouted, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread kid. And the gingerbread kid started running down the hill. And right behind came the fire chief in the fire truck. Woo! 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 The crossing guard with a stop sign, a babysitter with a handful of weeds, and Aaron with oven mitts. Oh, a gingerbread kid ran and ran through the park. That gingerbread kid ran right past Crystal, who was dribbling the basketball and shooting hoops. Well, Crystal licked her lips, give your lips a lick, and said, stop, stop, little gingerbread kid. You look good enough to eat. But the gingerbread kid shook their head and shouted, you can run, you can run as fast as you can, but you can't, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me on the gingerbread kid. And that gingerbread kid ran straight across the park and right behind came Aaron, or came Crystal, dribbling the basketball. The fire chief driving the fire truck. Woo, woo, woo! The crossing guard with a stop sign, the babysitter with a handful of weeds, and Aaron with the oven mitts on. That gingerbread kid ran and ran till they got to the Ottawa River. The gingerbread kid stopped. There was no bridge. There was no stand up paddleboard. There was no canoe, but there was a beaver swimming in the river. The beaver slept their tail, and the gingerbread kid shouted out, Beaver, would you please give me a ride across the Ottawa River? The beaver said, sure, get on my tail. And that's exactly what the gingerbread kid did. They got on the beaver's tail, and the beaver started to swim. And then the beaver looked up and said, Gingerbread kid, the river is deep. 
You should sit on my back. Pat your back. You know where the gingerbread kid's sitting now. And the beaver swam a bit further, and then the beaver said, Gingerbread kid, the river is deep, and the river is wide. You should sit on my head. So the gingerbread kid got up on the beaver's head. Give your head a pat. You know where the gingerbread kid is. The beaver kept swimming, and then the beaver said, Gingerbread kid, the river is wide, the river is deep, and the river is cold. You should sit on my nose. Tap your nose. And then the beaver tossed their head, and the gingerbread kid flew up in the air. And when the gingerbread kid came down, snap, went the beaver's teeth. And the gingerbread kid shouted, help, help, I'm one quarter gone. Snap, went the beaver's teeth again. And the gingerbread kid shouted, help, help, I'm one half gone. And the beaver's teeth went snap a third time. And the gingerbread kid shouted, help, help, I'm three quarters gone. And the next time the beaver's teeth went snap, the gingerbread kid said nothing at all because they were all gone. And Aaron and Crystal and the fire chief and the crossing guard and the babysitter, well, they all went back to the babysitter's house and had goldfish crackers and a glass of milk. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd like to finish with a spider story. Does that make anybody uncomfortable? You're going to need your hand to be the spider. If you put it down on the floor, there's a spider on the floor, on the floor. There's a spider on the floor, on the floor. Who could ask for any more? Then a spider on the floor. There's a spider on the floor, on the floor. The spider jumps onto your knee. And there's a spider on your knee, on your knee. There's a spider on your knee, on your knee. <gasps> How could that be? A spider on your knee. There's a spider on your knee, on your knee. The spider jumps onto your chest. There's a spider on your chest, on your chest. There's a spider on your chest, on your chest. How can you get any rest with a spider on your chest? There's a spider on your chest, on your chest. There's a spider on your shoulder, on your shoulder. There's a spider on your shoulder, on your shoulder. That spider's getting bolder. A spider on your shoulder. There's a spider on your shoulder, on your shoulder. And the spider jumps onto your head. There's a spider on your head, on your head. There's a spider on your head, on your head. <gasps> Don't you wish that you were dead? With a spider on your head? There's a spider on your head, on your head. And that spider jumps down, lands on the floor, and runs far, far away. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was wonderful. <laughs> Next up is Kathy Jessup. <laughs> Thank you. Is it okay if I mess with the mic and bring it yeah. up again? Yeah. A little bit taller. <laughs> um, all right. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I come from Edmonton. So, well, actually, I come from up on the Alaska Highway in northern British Columbia, up in the northern Rocky Mountains, just down the road from where Louise grew up. <laughs> My little town. Um, but I now live in Edmonton, and I've lived there for many years, and I'm delighted to be here. So I've got a story for you today. Um, and I know when I go into a lot of um, Indigenous communities, they have stories about drums, and I love drum stories. 
So I've learned a few stories from different parts of the world that, where there are also drums as an important part of their culture. And I'm going to share one from India. Uh, my ancestors come, would come from Ireland. And we have drums, a drum called the bow run, And we use it in our music. Sometimes you'll see that it's got a little stick with a bump on either end. And when they play, they hit it both ways. And it makes kind of a da-da-da-da-da-da rhythm. So whenever I'm around a, a drum, it also makes me think of my ancestors. Uh, this story from India is simply called a drum. So a long time ago, there was a woman and her son who lived at the edge of a village in India. And she was a widow, which means her husband had died. So it was just her and the little boy. And they were very poor. They never had enough food to eat. They were often hungry. And their clothes were kind of ragged. And the little boy never had nice toys to play with. But he loved his mom. And she absolutely loved him. And together, they just sort of got by. But there was one way that they could make a little bit of money. They had a, a field beside their hut, and they would grow grain. And every once in a while, they would harvest some of that grain, and the mom would take it into the village, and she'd sell it in the market. And she'd get a few coins, and with that money, she would try to, to buy whatever it was that they couldn't make or grow for themselves. But it was a hard life. And one day, she was going into the, the market, and she said to her son, can I get you something? And the little boy knew that they didn't have any money. And he knew his mom didn't mean, oh, I can buy you a fancy big present. He knew that she probably meant that she might have enough coins left over. She could maybe buy him a, a little candy or a, you know, like a donut, something like that. Um, and he said, um, you know, mom, uh, I, I don't think I really need anything. So it's OK. You save our money for, for more important things. And she said, well, it doesn't matter what, what you need. I, I want to know if you want something. Maybe I can't afford it. So what do you want? And the little boy said, well, Mom, what I really want and what I dream of having one day is a drum. But I, I know we'll never have enough money left over for something like a drum, and that's OK. And he looked at his mother's face, and he knew he was right. And the mother looked at her son, and it, it made her really sad because she thought, you know, He's right. He, he knows that we, I'll never have enough money, and he's such a good boy, and I love him so much, and he only wants one thing, and I can never get it for him. And that made her heart really sad. And so when she went to market that day, all the way to market, she was thinking about how much she loved her boy and how good he was to her, and, it, and she just had this heavy, heavy weight on her heart. And she got to market, and she did what she had to do, and she's walking home, and she's still thinking about it, and. She's feeling bad because she's empty-handed. She has nothing for her boy. And as she was walking along, she saw something out of the corner of her eye. And it, and it made her kind of jump. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it happens to me. Sometimes, just out of the corner of your eye, you see something, and you think, oh, it's a bug, or it's a, a mouse or something. And then you look, and it's just a stone, or a, a leaf blowing in the wind, and you feel kind of silly. Well, this mom thought she saw a snake. And so she, ah, she got all scared, and then she looked, and she laughed at herself because all it was was a stick. But it looked like a snake. It had a kind of a blob on one end, and then it sort of bent a little bit like this, and it tapered down to what looked kind of like a tail. And she bent down and she picked it up, and she marveled at how much it looked like a snake. And then she got an idea. She thought, you know, I'm going to take this stick home to my boy. Because if I think it's really interesting, he probably will like it, and at least I'll be giving him something. So she takes the stick and she gets home and she shows it to her son. And he was really thrilled because remember, he didn't have many toys and he wasn't expecting anything. And when he took that stick, he thought, yeah, that does look like a snake. That's cool. And so he thanked his mom and outside he goes with his stick, his st snake stick. Now, as he's outside kind of looking at it and playing with it, he looks across and they had a little bit of land and then the road came by. And on the far side of the road, he noticed there's a woman and she's squatted down by a little portable cook stove. Obviously, she's trying to cook maybe her supper. But all there is is big clouds of smoke coming out of that little stove. And as the woman looked up at him and saw him, her, her eyes were just streaming tears. And he thought the lady was crying. So he went up to her and he said, what's the matter? Why, why are you so sad? And the lady said, well, I'm not really sad. You see, I'm, I'm just trying to, to make a fire for my, to cook my, my chapatis. And she said, and I don't have any proper fuel, so I'm trying to use dried dung, and it's not working. It's just making smoke, and, and that's why my eyes are watering. And the little boy said, oh, you need fuel? Well, um, would my stick work? And the lady said, yes, that would work perfectly. That's exactly what I need. Thank you. 
And she took the stick and she broke it up into pieces and she shoved it into the fire. And right away there was a little flame started to, to burn. And so she said, I can cook my chapatis, which is like a flatbread, right? Like almost like a tortilla. A flatbread, kind of like a culture, like, like there would be bannock. And she takes that and she cooks that chapati on the stove. And she said, you know, you've been so kind. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be having supper tonight. So the very first chapati I make, I want you to have it. And so when the chapati came off the fire, she gave it to the little boy and he thanked her. Remember, he was always hungry. So he took the chapati and it was hot. So he started to toss it between his hands to cool it. And he began walking down the road doing that to cool it down so he could eat it. Now, the road was going to go around a corner. And from around the corner, he could hear the sound of a child crying. And he gets around the corner and looks and he can see the potter's wife. Now in India, many of those villages, each one would have a potter. And that was a man who would make the pots uh, to cook him. And the people would buy the pots from him and that's how he made his living. Well, this was his wife and she was holding their baby and that baby was wailing away. And the little boy went up to her and he said, is your, is your baby sick? Why, why is it crying? And the lady said, oh, I tell you, this morning my husband, well, you know, he's a fine potter. He makes good pots. And he piled all his pots onto a wagon and he was gonna take them to the market and he's gonna sell those pots and he'll make money. And with that money, he's going to buy some food and he will bring it home and we will eat. But for whatever reason, my husband's late coming home tonight and we have no food and my baby cries. And once again, the baby was screaming and wailing. And the little boy looked at her and he held out the chapati and he said, well, would your baby like this chapati? Because I'm not hungry anyway, he can have it. And in truth, that was a lie because the little boy was always hungry. But he wanted that baby to have the chapati, so he handed it over and the lady, oh, she was so pleased. She tore off a chunk and she put it in the baby's mouth and he sucked away and he gummed on that. And right away he quit crying. And boy, any mother whose baby quits crying, she was so thankful. She said, you are a really kind boy and I wish I could pay you for this. I wish I could give you something, but I have nothing. I have, wait a minute. I have something I can give you. You know, this morning when my husband went to market and he put all those pots on, he had so many, he had to leave a big one behind, one of his finest, and I'm going to give it to you. So she went over and she picked up this big pot and she gave it to the boy and he thanked her. He wasn't quite sure what he was gonna do with a pot, but he'd never been given much of anything and it was a gift. He said, thank you very much. And down the road he goes carrying this pot. So he's walking along, thinking what a, a grand day this is, and his, the road continues, and it goes by a river. And up ahead, he sees two people. He thinks maybe it's a husband and a wife, and they're having an argument. The husband is waving his arms, and he's yelling, and the wife is waving right back at him, and she's yelling. And he goes up to, her and he, up to them, and he says, um, um, is, there a, is there a problem? And the man said, oh, my careless wife. He said, I am a washerman. How I make my living? I have a pot, I get water from that river there, I light a fire under it, people bring me their clothes, and I wash their clothes, I do a great fine job, and they pay me. And with that money, I buy our food, and that is how we live. But my careless wife, she was not looking where she was going, she kicked the pot, look at it, rolled down the bank there in a thousand pieces, I can't fix that, I guess we'll starve. And the little boy looked at them and he said, um, you need a pot? Well, uh, you can have this pot. And the man said, well, I have no money to, to pay you. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't do that. And the little boy said, oh, it's okay. Somebody gave me this pot. I can give it to you. Will, will it work? And the man said, well, yes, that's the, that's the perfect size. Thank you. And he took the pot and he set it on the ground and he said, I wish I had some, some money, but I have, wait a minute. I do have something I can give you. And he walked over to where there was a big tree and there was a bulging sack under the tree. And he starts rummaging around in there and he pulls out a man's suit jacket. And he says to the boy, you know, it's a strange thing, but sometimes people drop off their clothes and they forget to come back for them. And I've had this coat for a long time. I don't think anybody's coming back for it. I want you to have it. And he gave it to the boy. So the little boy puts on the mad suit jacket, and of course it's too big. It's hanging down off his hands, it's hanging down to his knees. But that little boy had never had anything fine to wear. He had always had the ragged clothes, remember? And when he put that coat on, he thought, I will grow. One day I will fit this jacket perfectly. And as soon as he put it on, he felt like a man already. 
So he thanked the washerman, and down the road he goes thinking, oh yeah, I look pretty good. I look pretty hot in this jacket. So down the road he's going, and he sees the strangest sight coming towards him. It's a man leading a horse. But that's not exactly the strange part. The strange thing was the man had no clothes on, except his underwear, and he was dripping wet. So the boy wants to laugh. He wants to laugh, but then he looks at the man's face, and it looks like thunder. Oh, he is angry. So the boy goes up to him, and he goes, um, what has happened to you? And the man said, you won't believe the day I'm having. He said, I set out this morning, walking down the road, minding my own business, going to my brother's house, and all of a sudden, this guy comes rushing up on a horse, and he jumps down, and he threatens me. He says, I have to give him all my clothes, or else he's going to harm me. Because it turns out, he's running away from the police, and he wants my clothes as a disguise. So when he threatened me, what could I do? I had to take off my clothes, and then before I even had a chance to think, he shoved me into the river, into the deepest part. Well, by the time I got out of the river and back up on the road, he's long gone. He took off still wearing his own clothes and carrying mine. So I get up on the road and he's gone and all that's left is this horse. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with a horse, but he left it, so I took it. And he, there he is holding the reins. And as he said, I took it, he just kind of gave a little shiver. And the boy looked at him and he said, you look cold. And without another word, he just took off the jacket and he gave it to the man. And the band didn't even pretend not to want it. He was so grateful, he just nodded to the boy, and he put it on. And he said, you know, that is so incredibly kind of you. I can see you don't have much yourself. But I still don't have pants, but at least with this jacket, I have something and my dignity, and I, and I thank you for that. And then he said, you know, I may not have much to give you, but I think you should have this horse. What am I going to do with a horse? I don't even know how to ride a horse. You take it. And he shoved the reins into the boy's hands. Well, the boy didn't know how to ride a horse either, and he wasn't quite sure how he was going to explain it to his mother. But what kid is going to refuse the gift of a free horse? So, of course, he took the reins, and he's going down the road thinking, I can't believe this day. My mom is never going to believe what's been happening to me. Now, by this time, a lot of hours had passed since he left his home. Hours in the day. And in India, when you get to sort of the mid-afternoon, it is really hot. Many places in India, terribly hot. So you think back to the hottest day last summer, when you were thinking, I can't stand it, it's so hot, and you add on a whole bunch more hot. And that's how hot it is in India in the middle of the day. So what they do is they get out of the heat. They either go in their houses and they have a little rest in the cool darkness of their house, or sometimes if they can find a nice big shady tree, they go under it and they wait till things get a little cooler. Now the little boy right now with the horse, he happened to be in a big grassy area and there was only one tree in the distance. So he starts walking for that tree, a big shade tree. And as he looks, he sees some people kind of gathered underneath. Of course, they're all hiding from the sun. And as he gets a little closer still, he looks and he can see that they're dressed in really fine clothes. You know the special kind of clothes you wear if there's a ceremony you're going to or maybe a wedding or something? And he gets a little closer still. And of course, if you knew somebody that was going to a ceremony or a wedding, they would be really excited and happy. But he's looking at these people and all of them look so sad and depressed and some of them look even angry. Some of them are crying. And he, it looks to him like he can kind of see, you know, maybe a groom's parents, maybe some family members, maybe some musicians. There's a whole bunch of people. And as he gets closer, he calls up to them and he said, um, I can see you're, you're dressed for a wedding and I, I would think you might be happy, but you all look really sad and, and angry. What's wrong? And the father of the groom spoke up and he said, well, it's a disaster. It's a, there was supposed to be a wedding. There will be no wedding. It is a disaster. The boy said, what do you mean? What's, what's wrong? And he said, well, it's a custom in our village that the groom will ride on a horse to the bride's village and he collects her, and together they go to the temple to be married. And so, my family gathered all our money, and we paid a man to bring a horse to this spot at a certain time. But that hour has long passed. And I realize he's tricked us. There will be no horse, he's not coming. And without a horse, we can't do the ceremony. And without that, there can be no wedding. And so, our honor is ruined. Our family is disgraced. 
And then everybody started to kind of cry and wring their hands again. And the little boy said, wait, wait, you need a horse to save the wedding? The man said, yes. And the little boy said, well, take this horse. And the man said, no, I, I, I couldn't take your horse. I can't pay you for it. And the little boy said, oh, no, it's a gift. I give it to you. And the man looked at him sadly and said, but too big a gift. I can't take a gift if I have nothing to give you back. I just can't. And the little boy said, but, but I want to. Somebody gave it to me. I can give it to you. I insist. I, I want you to have this for the wedding. And if the wedding goes ahead, that is my gift. So the man took the reins and everybody went crazy. They were laughing and crying with happiness and jumping up and down and hugging each other and hugging the groom and hugging the boy. And finally, the groom spoke up and he said, wait, everybody, wait. There has got to be something we can give this little boy. Now, we might not have any money, but he has saved our honor and he has saved the wedding and there's got to be something. So come on, search your pockets, search your packs. We're giving him something. So everybody began to search their pockets and their packs. And one of the musicians reached into his pack and he pulled out a drum. Uh. Now it wasn't a fancy drum. It was an old battered up little hand drum. And you could see it was the worst for wear, but it was a drum. And he held it out to the little boy and he said, I don't suppose you'd want this drum. Oh, well, I don't know if you've ever wanted anything in your life so bad and you know you'll never get it. And so you don't even let your brain think about it. You don't even go there because you know it's never going to happen. And if somebody gave you that thing, if they put it in your hands, how would you feel? Like, what could you possibly say? And that little boy just, his hands were shaking and it took him a second, but finally he just took that drum and he just held it to his heart. And then when he could speak, he just simply said to the man, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then he turned and he started running for home with his shaking legs. And he was running down the road as hard as he could wave on that drum. And as he got closer to the hut, he began yelling, Mom, Mom, I got a drum, I got a drum, Mom. And he bursts in the door of the hut, up to his mom, throws his arms around her, and he's babbling the whole story. Everything that happened to him that day. And when he finally gets to the end, his mom gently took him by the shoulders and she kind of untangled his arms and pushed him away from her a little bit. And she gave him a funny kind of a grin and she said, so this morning when I gave you that stick, I guess in a way I did give you the gift you wanted most in the world. But in fact, the little boy received many gifts that day, right? And I kind of think the greatest gift of all is this story, a drum. Thank you so much for that wonderful story, Kathy. <laughs> Do I have to introduce myself? <laughs> Hi, my name is Crystal Snowboy. I am from the Cree Nation of GSACB up in the James Bay area. Well, Eastern James Bay area. <laughs> so my story is from a long time. We're here at this beautiful place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so my story comes from a long time ago. It is in my great grand. This is my great grandfather's story, and I wish to share it with all of you. <laughs> so long ago, it was during like residential school. My grandfather, my great grandfather was able to go home for the holidays. And he got to go home to his parents. And when he got home, he saw that his parents were all packed up and he runs to them and says, where are we going? I just got here. And they're like, we are gonna go to camp. We are gonna go, we are gonna leave early tomorrow morning and we are gonna go to camp. And that's where we're gonna spend our winter break. And Robert got so excited, he went to running to his room and packed all of his stuff. He grabbed his warmest hat, he grabbed his warmest moccasins, grabbed his warmest gloves, and got ready. So that evening, when they had supper, his father came out and said, Robert, come help me with the, come help me feed 
The dog sled team. This is recording. Oh, this is recording. <laughs> oh, that is. <laughs> Those are my pictures. <laughs> Come help me feed the dog sled team. So this is what they look like. So there's many of them that pull the sled. So this is what they were going to the bush with. See that? <laughs> so him and his father got ready and fed the dogs so they wouldn't be too tired. So once they got ready to go to sleep, they started and they woke up that morning and started packing all their stuffs on the sled. So I don't know if you could see it in the picture, but this is the sled. So they put all their stuff inside there to go to camp. And they used the dog sled team to go to the bush. And as they arrived to their camp, which is called Sill River, <laughs> so they arrive to their camp and he sees his brother John who he hasn't seen for a long time and his brother John talks to him and tells him hey did your teacher talk to you and Robert says what about and they said well we heard about something called Christmas and there's a big man in a red suit that comes to your house. Did you hear about him? Then John asks his brother Robert. He's like, no, I must have been too excited when they told me I'll be going home. <laughs> I didn't hear about this man, so he comes in your house? That's strange. <laughs> So after a while, his father goes hunting to get meat on, some meat on the table. But for the past couple of days, he didn't bring home anything. He said he didn't see nothing. So his grandmother goes into the kitchen and counts how many things they have. And they only have four ptarmigan. So ptarmigan are these white little birds. and they had two rabbits. And only one bag of caribou meat. And there was six of them in the house. It was his grandparents, his parents, and his brother John. So I don't think that meat is gonna last them very long because they need to eat three times a day. So Robert overheard his parents talking. I don't think we have enough meat. I think we're gonna have to send the kids back to school, they say, because we won't be able to feed them. And then John says, wait, it's gonna be Christmas soon. Maybe we can ask Santa to bring something. <laughs> <laughs> so before they go to sleep that night, Robert and John sit out by their beds and they say a little prayer. And they say, Creator, could you help my parents get something to eat tomorrow? Help my dad with his hunt? Or maybe you can ask Santa to bring something. And they say, Amen, and go to bed that night. <laughs> and that morning, John hears his grandmother screaming, Hey, wake up, wake up! And and they get up, still scratching their eyes. What's going on, they say. Look, 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 come and see into the kitchen, they say. So Robert and John go running, go inside the kitchen. And they see mountains, <laughs> buckets of ptarmigan, some moose meat, some caribou meat, all piled up in their kitchen. And they only had six just last night. They're like, where did this come from? Robert and John turn to each other and say, do you think it was Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> and then they turn around and they say, we found something with your names on them. One says Robert and the other one says John. It's a big giant sock and it's red. 
I think there's something inside because it's really heavy. And they're like, a giant sock? Who needs a giant sock? They said. <laughs> there's two of them, so there must be a giant man somewhere. <laughs> So they dig inside these giant socks. And the first thing Robert pulls out, it's red, round, and small. What do you think it is? <laughs> it's small, round, and red. Apple. Yes, it was an apple, and they've never seen these before. It's a long time ago because we are really far up north that we don't have fruits or vegetables growing up there. It's too cold. <laughs> so it was the first time Robert some saw something that bright. <laughs> and then John looks in his giant sock <laughs> and he digs in and he sees something orange and round. And he's like, what is this? <laughs> what do you think it was? Yeah, it was an orange. <laughs> and then John pulls something else, but it's small and it's wrapped. It's wrapped in plastic, but it smells so sweet. What do you think it is? <laughs> yeah, you're right, it is candy. <laughs> And that is the story of Robert's first Christmas. <laughs> I would like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Help me. <laughs> I would also like to thank everybody for coming tonight. It's been a wonderful night. We have all these wonderful storytellers. It's been uh, Kathy Compass and Louise the Prophet of Blanc and Kathy Jessup and Crystal Snowboard. Yeah. She has such an infectious laugh. It's wonderful. Um, so I'd like to uh, just, uh, we have a lovely association with the Odawa Friendship Center here and I hope it lasts for a long time, long, long time. Um, and in saying that, they are, they are one of our partners, um, as well as the Ottawa Public Library, Ottawa Community Foundation, and, and uh, these are some of our sponsors and some of our partners. Uh, Les Écoles Catholiques Centre Est, the Consortium Centre of Jules Léger, the City of Ottawa, the Storytellers of Canada, the Ottawa Storytellers, who has made this happen uh, for us here in Ottawa this week. Uh, the Harry P. Ward Foundation, the Ottawa Arts Council, the Fleck Foundation, the Beck, Bob Fleck Creative Foundation, Oda uh, Ottawa Bilingual, Rogers TV, who has been very gracious in uh, helping us uh, promote as well, uh, Province of Ontario, the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, the Federal Government of Canada, and the Sign Language Interpreting Associates of Ottawa, the Association des Communautés Francophones d'Ottawa, and the Circle of Francophone Storytellers. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Please, please do not forget, we have uh, surveys at our table over here that we, need, that we would like you to fill out. It helps us uh, promote uh, that this event will happen again next year. And there's arts and crafts for the kids to play with and to... Uh